This is episode 504 of the Locked On Texas Rangers podcast. On today's podcast, I'm making trades. I'm wheeling and dealing some trades that the Rangers have been linked to. And with these trades, I'm doing what the Rangers should do if they want to compete this year in the playoffs, some hypothetical trades that could make them contenders right now to actually have a great 2022 season after the worst season in franchise history since the first years that they moved to Texas. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked on to the Texas Rangers. I'm your host, Bryce Paddock, here today at the end of a fantastic week of Rangers baseball. Even though there was no baseball, this is the best week the Rangers have had in many, many moons. Uh, I want to thank you for making Locked On Rangers your first listen of the day. Make sure you go follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Rangers. Follow me on Twitter at Bryce Paddock. Also, go subscribe on YouTube or wherever the heck you get your podcasts. Or don't. I'm, I'm not your dad. If you like it, you know, maybe leave a nice review. Um, there's some some dot nice reviews on iTunes, so go leave a, a five star one if you like the podcast, and hit that thumbs up button on YouTube. If you don't like it, then hit the uh, upside down uh, thumbs down button. It looks it looks like a thumbs up, but I promise you an upside down uh, thumbs down. Um, so you will let people know that you do not like this podcast. But you know, it, it's a Friday. It's it's a good time for hypotheticals. It's a good time to end the week on a high note. Dreaming big because the Rangers dreamed very small last year and they uh, just had an awful season. Absolutely terrible 102 loss season. Now, I want to I want to start with this. The, this is not what I think the Rangers will do. Um, not all of these trades are things I think that they will do and definitely not all of them together. I think that there's a reason they said 2023 is uh, the target year for contention again because it takes a long time. And if they did all these trades, there would be basically just so little continuity between this upcoming year's team and the 2021 team, which that's probably a good thing because they were so bad, but you also need time to gel and get used to things. This will be a lot of people's first years in Arlington. So they need some time to adjust and figure out what it's like here, what it's like to play for the Texas Rangers. So, but let's start by looking at what it takes to be a contending team. This team was bad last year. They were very bad. And what it takes to be an actual playoff contender now, in a normal year, let's look at some of the, the worst, I think, playoff contention teams or just playoff teams that the Rangers had. Let's look at 2013. I think they did go technically 163. Um, just not a super duper great team, not a very consistent team. A lot of great talent at the top end. Obviously, you have Adrian Beltre, you had Nelson Cruz that was still doing some work. Um, other than that, it was there's not much in this team. Not a great year from Ian Kinsler, not a great year from AJ Przinski, Mitch Moreland. There wasn't much there. There just really wasn't much on this team. The, the pitching staff, which is just such a weird pitching staff this year. They had Derek Holland, which led the team in innings in 213. It's just kind of weird. Hugh Darvish had one of his best years ever with a uh, 283 ERA. Martin Perez, Alexio Gondo. And then the five and six roles in the rotation were basically interchangeable of Nick Tepish and Justin Graham. Gosh, that was, uh, such a throwback. But they had a really great bullpen that year. So I think the Rangers will have a really good bullpen. I don't know about... This great a bullpen. This was an absolutely one of the best bullpen the Rangers had in general, like in their history. Joe Nathan had an amazing year, a 139 ERA. You had Tanner Shepard in the setup role, a sub two ERA as well. Robbie Ross, a three ERA. Neil Cotts had his randomly unbelievably good season, the 111 ERA. And Jason Fraser had a 257 ERA. Like just a really good bullpen from top to bottom. And that was able to make up for a lineup that didn't have a whole lot of juice in it outside of Adrian Beltre. A pretty good defensive team, actually a really good defensive team with Mitch Moreland, Ian Kinsler, Elvis Andrews, and Adrian Beltre. That is a gold glove caliber infield. The honest, my team was providing a lot of value in center field defensively, not a whole lot bringing to the table offensively. So that's about what the worst team looks like when they're when they're trying to compete. Let's look at the best team in Rangers history and what it took to compete. This is an absolutely unbelievably good offensive lineup. You had Ian Kinsler at his absolute peak, over an 800 OPS. Josh Hamilton absolutely crushing it. Nelson Cruz crushing it. Michael Young also crushing it as the DH. Mike Napoli as 
catching way more games than he should with an OPS over a thousand. This team was just stacked from top to bottom with fantastic bats and also pretty great two-way players. A really solid um, pitching staff. Nothing like star worthy, really. I mean, CJ Wilson was pretty good that year. Like honestly, really good for his standards. Colby Lewis was fine enough. Everybody was about fine. They had their moments. Matt Harrison, Derek Holland, and Alexi Ogando. The, again, the bullpen was outstanding that year. Neftali Feliz, Darren Oliver, Mark Lowe. <sighs> Excuse me for saying Mark Lowe in, in the same words as a great bullpen. But Darren Oliver and Neftali Feliz were both fantastic. Darren O'Day, um, not a great year for him. Mike Adams was really good in the bullpen as well that year. Granted, in a you know more limited sample size than some of the other guys, but still pretty solid in the bullpen. Also, there was Scott Feldman doing some things as well. Um, but anyway, and then let's also look at this year's AL West champion and what it took for them to get to the playoffs and be, well, honestly, one of the, the better teams to actually get all the way to the World Series. But their lineup, again, this was probably better than the 2011 Rangers lineup. I, I Actually, I don't know. I don't want to say that. Because not everybody had a, a great year. They had some some really great hitters. They had Yuli, Yuli Gurriel um, doing fantastic. Carlos Correa, Jose Altuve. Alex Bregman even took a step back this year, and so did Michael Brantley. But they just made it up by having Kyle Tucker and Jordan Alvarez absolutely crush it. Now, this pitching staff kind of reminds me of the Rangers pitching staff in 2011, except I think C.J. Wilson had a better year than most of these guys did as well. No real stars. I mean, Zach Greinke has been a star, but with a 418 ERA and 170 innings. Like, that's not exactly star level for a team that is winning the division. Lance McCullers had a really solid year, but again, all these guys pitched around 150 innings. Luis Garcia, just fine. Fran Valdez, fine. Jose Arquini, fine. Jake Odorizzi, fine. Nasty bullpen with Ryan Presley, Christian Javier, Brian Stanek, Brooks Raley, um, and some of these other guys as well. But yeah, that's about what it takes. So keep that in mind. And the Rangers this year... I mean, how many above average bats did they have? According to OPS Plus, at the end of the season, they had uh, Nathaniel Lowe and just barely Adolfo Garcia, a 101 OPS Plus. So, what do you need? Four, five, maybe six bats that are above average? Two of those, three of those have to be really dang good star level. The Rangers have no star level bats. So, let's trade for some. Let's trade for some. We already signed two. They already signed two. So let's make some hypothetical trades. And I'm going to get into that. Some links, the who the Rangers have been linked to in trades, who I think they should think about trading. And even one player who they're not linked to, but I'm just going to you know go ahead and trade for him anyway. Because you know if you listen to this podcast, you, could, you already know who this is. But first, I got to talk to you guys about Built Bar. This holiday season, you can grab a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar or even better than a candy bar. Built Bar filled with so much holiday goodness, rich with decadent flavor, covered in chocolate, but amazingly low calories, sugar, net carbs, and fat. And yeah, you guessed it, high in protein. It's the best of both worlds, delicious and healthy. There's a bazillion different flavors and Built Bar gives you that extra fuel you need to push down those mall doors if you're if you're going to malls these days. Um, you can battle all the holiday shoppers or if you're standing in endless shopping lines, Built Bar can give you that extra something to keep you going. So throw one in your jacket, your purse. You never know when you're gonna need it. Because it's a season of peace and love do not bring up your favorite Bill Bar at family gatherings. There will be fights. There will be hairs pulled. There will be um, bloodshed, maybe. I don't know, maybe not. But if you're friends with Santa, well, you got to tell Santa to throw a few Bill Bars in those stockings. If you want to cozy up to something warm, here's a holiday secret. Dip your Bill Bar in piping hot cup of hot cocoa. Let it melt a little bit and give your beverage a flavor and a bit of that Bill Bar flavor. Plus, you have a nice melty Bill Bar to go with it. So make sure to have a couple napkins on hand. Like so many of those marshmallow treats around the holidays, you know, there's a Bilt Bar that's just like them. You get your hands on Bilt Bar Puffs. They're light, fluffy, marshmallow through and through different flavors, all covered in chocolate. Tastes so good. You won't believe they're filled with protein. Go to Bilt.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Bilt.com. Now, we might get irrational towards the end of this podcast. We've probably started in the place of the range of for playoffs the year after they lost 102 games. But you know what? Screw it. It's Friday. It's been a great week. They're in a lockout. Let's just build on something happy and have some hope for once. Why not? There's no one saying we can't. There's no law against it. There's no active collective bargaining agreement. So therefore, 
there are no rules. I mean, there's also nothing happening, but that doesn't mean something can happen eventually. And I, I think it will. And I think the Rangers are definitely going to be seriously. I don't, I don't know if they can talk theoretically about, about trades. I know they can't talk with players. Maybe the GMs can like talk with each other. They know they can't do anything, but like maybe those talks can happen for the GMs because they're not going to be the ones that are in on this collective bargaining agreement. So maybe, maybe they can get on, on some of this stuff. So who, here's who the Rangers have been linked to um, in trade talks. Basically four names, two different teams. Matt Olson, the first baseman of the Oakland A's, who has been fantastic at a career year. And uh, I would like very much to be on this team. And then three Reds pitchers, all of whom have two years of control. All of them had pretty decent uh, years last year. And all of whom, I guess two of them, I don't know if Tyler, Tyler Malley has made um, an all-star game, but two of them has definitely made an all-star game. Luis Castillo, Sonny Gray, and Tyler Malley. Yeah, those are three names that I really like. Um, and three guys who I think would definitely help the Rangers pitching staff. Do I think the Rangers are going to trade for all of them? No, no, I, I don't. I really don't. Um, but I think they could trade for one of them. I think that would definitely um, help them out a lot because this rotation definitely needs some help. And, uh, you know, I would like to, uh, I would like to upgrade this team and maybe make them be good. Um, my gosh, I'm trying to, I, I was stalling because I'm trying to look up these guys on baseball savant, but since baseball savant, I realize is now owned by MLB. Yeah. Uh, I can't see any of their pictures while I'm looking up. So there are several Luis Castillo's that are here. And I believe this is the right Luis Castillo. Um, where'd we go? We're looking at his, uh, velocity. Where'd we go? Where are, where are we? Oh my goodness. Yeah. All right. This is the right one. This is the right one. I had to make double sure, um, that this was the right one, but we are here. Yeah. Okay. This Luis Castillo is a 28 year old has been an all-star before he is a member of the Reds. Um, but I wasn't starting with him. What am I doing? I'm getting ahead of myself. Luis Castillo is, is going to be the one of these three Reds that I'm going to do. Sorry to, to spoil the party, but let's start with Matt Olson. Let's just start in a silly place that is a great place. I mean, it's not silly because he's actually been linked to the Rangers. And I think that there is some actual interest there. And I think the Rangers should definitely go do this. But he is coming off a great season, 156 games where he played fantastic. A 5.8 war season, which is hard to do as a first baseman because some a lot of the war comes from de defense. And... First baseman don't usually get awarded with a lot of defensive war. He is a two-time gold glover at one time. All-star, finished top 10 in MVP voting this year, was just fantastic. Now on base, 371, slugged 540. That's a 911 OPS, 39 home runs this year, 35 doubles. Um, and if you like batting average, then uh, 271 is fine. Um, but yeah, 88 walks to 113 strikeouts, so pretty good strikeout to walk ratio. Again, playing gold gl glove caliber defense. Actually, he didn't win a gold glove this year, but he won two back to back in 2018 and 19. I honestly think he probably should have won it this year. I don't. Even, I think Yuli Gurriel won it this year. I I don't know why. I think he might be fine, but uh, he's not as good defensively as Matt Olson. So he's got two years of control. A's are like, we're in full rebuild. We're just tearing everything down. Obviously, look, we, we let Bob Melvin go. So, you know, <laughs> we're we're obviously on the, the down and down, not the, the up and up, the down and down. So here's an offer that I think makes sense. This is a guy who is MVP caliber. You're going to have to give up a lot. Um, but the A's also are looking for cheap, half-decent players that are going to be under control for a long time. That's Nathaniel Lowe. I think this starts with Nathaniel Lowe. You ship him off to uh, to Oakland. They get a first baseman to play first base and be fine and be cheap and under control for a while. That's him. You also have to give up some prospect leverage. So I think Ezekiel Duran, a guy who just is coming off a, a very great Arizona Fall League performance, 19 games where he had a 944 OPS yeah, he's one of the guys who was in the Joey Gallo, return for Joey Gallo. He came over from New York. This year in, in 38 games with Hickory, he did not do well. Had an OPS under 700 at 695. But in 67 games with high A Hudson Valley with the Yankees, he had a 907 OPS. Yeah, again, 67 games. He had 12 home runs in there. Um, in the foul league, he had a uh, three home runs, four triples, and seven doubles in 19 games. This guy was just a hitting machine. He also had a 333 on base percentage, but while he was with uh, the Yankees in high A, a 374 on base in those 67 games, nearly 300 plate appearances. That is solid. Um, 
900 OPS at two of the three stops that he played at this year. I think that, you know, he's obviously blocked he's, he, it with the next several years. He's projected to come up in 2023. He could be fine, pretty good, controllable for a long time. Um, so he is going to be the headliner in that deal. His value is very high. Also, Justin Foskey, you guys coming off a really great season, had a crap ton of home runs. That was 17 home runs in 62 games this year. Um, just absolutely went hammy. 590 slugging percentage, a 371 on base percentage. You need to give up two of these blue chip guys to go get him. And I think I think Sam Hupp. You, you're going to have to give up a lot of guys because none of these guys are the Rangers' top three prospects who I think are, well, I think the top two in Josh Young and Jack Leiter, both of those guys are are pretty much untouchable. But this guy is, is going to make you think about giving up some of those guys. So, so yeah, I think... I think Sam Huff is is what is going to take to get in this. And then also Glenn Otto. You're going to have to give up a lot. You're just going to have to give up a lot. And I know people are saying, what? That's just like kind of a marginal upgrade um, from Nathaniel Lowe. But I think the upgrade defensively is massive. The upgrade offensively, I think, is massive. Maybe Nathaniel Lowe with these new hitting coaches comes in and like just goes off and goes crazy. And you don't need to trade for, for Matt Olson. It's just a luxury. But I, I think it's worth it. Because you need so many star bats, and right now you have two. You have two bats that are star caliber quality right now at this point. Josh Young is going to be up this year. He's going to be a pretty good, a pretty good hitter, I think. But he's a rookie, so expecting him to be star caliber as a rookie, I think, is definitely a bit much. I think he'll be pretty solid, but having huge expectations for him. This is in this scenario. I'm trying to get the Rangers to the playoffs this year. So yeah. I don't think you can count on that. So you, at this point, you have three star bats, and um, I think you might need one more, and you definitely need a starting pitcher. And we're going to get to who that second bat and who that pitcher are. But first, I got to tell you guys about Bet Online. This episode is brought to you by Bet Online, and Bet Online has you covered all season more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season continues their march to the playoffs. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. So head to the new updated desktop or mobile website, sign up today, receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code locked on to receive your bonus from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. You want to bet on the Cowboys to go win it all because they just won last night against the Saints and you feel really good about that. Sure. You can go do that there. You want to bet on, you know, the Mavs or the Stars to to go nuts? Sure. You want to put some some odds on on the Rangers doing all these trades and going to the playoffs next year. I, I'm not saying that I would advise it, but I'm saying that you could do it at Bet Online because Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. Now, this next player, the Rangers, right now, I think John Gray might be might be good enough to be a number one. I'm not sure. He was good enough to be Colorado's number one, which, again, Colorado is just, just such, a, such a dumpster fire. They have no idea what the heck's going on there. But I don't know. Well, but he's good. He's he's good, but I think you need one more, at least one more, established starting pitcher, a guy that you can count on for innings, a guy that you can count on to have some absolutely stellar starts. And you're going to need several of those. And I think you can get it from Luis Castillo. Luis Castillo is a uh, Cincinnati Red. He has been an all-star. He has a lot of value. He has been just absolutely electric in his career, and I just really love watching him pitch. He has been so much fun to watch. He was an all-star back in 2019, his age 26 season, where he had a 340 ERA. Um, he was top 10 in rookie of the year voting back in 2017. He's 28 years old. He's been in the big leagues for a while. He's got two years of control on him, um, so... You're going to have him for a couple of seasons. So I feel good about that. This year was a pretty solid season for him. But again, you got to keep in mind his numbers are uh, in a very, very hitter friendly park. For the last three years, this has been his ERA plus uh, in 2019 when he was an all star, a 173 ERA plus, a 153 ERA plus last year in the shortened season um, in Cincinnati. And this year, a 120 ERA plus, an actual ERA of 398 pitched in. Uh, where we go? 33 games, 187 innings, struck out 192. He has 70, 70 
770 strikeouts in uh, 707 career innings, 9.8 career strikeouts per nine innings. Those uh, until in 1920, he had a strikeouts per nine of 10.7 and 11.4. He has just been a strikeout machine and he throws hard. He throws real hard. He's got a fastball that averages um, 97 miles an hour. He's basically a three-pitch pitcher. He's got that, a changeup, which is just nasty. One of the best changeups in baseball. He's also got a slider. The changeup is 88 miles an hour. The slider is um, 86. He uses the changeup around 30% of the time and the slider around 17% of the time. Looking at some of his percentile rankings um, and aver average exit velocity, he is uh, in the top quarter of the league, hard hit percentage um, over the top half. Expected ERA. Top 30%, expected Wobo top 30%, expected slugging top 20%, barrel percentage, so nobody's getting barrels on this guy. And the top 10%, uh, fastball velocity, top 5%, chase rate, top quarter of the league, whiff rate, top third of the league. A little bit of a walk problem um, in the bottom, around the bottom third of the league in uh, walk percentage. And it's also his fastball spin rate. Not only is it fast, but it's in the top half of uh, fastball spin rate. So when you're averaging um, 97 miles an hour and you've got a good spin rate on it, that is a nasty, nasty combination. Now you got a couple of years of control of this guy, and I think when he is on, he is one of the best pitchers in baseball. He's been fairly consistent. You can count on him for a bunch of innings. This year he pitched 188 innings, basically 190 back in the last full season, and just one out shy of 170 in 2018. He also pitched 70 innings in the shortened season in 12 games. So this is a guy you can count on, and I think he's got top of the line stuff. And I think it might cost a whole lot. This is why I'm a little sheepish on it. This might be a, a a little higher than I think anybody else would be willing to go, but I, I think it might cost Cole Wynn, Josh Smith, and Avery Weems. That's the package that I'm putting together. If you don't feel comfortable with that, I, I totally understand it, and I think you might be able to pivot to Frankie Montas. I think it would cost a lot less. You package him with Matt Olson, so you go and throw a few more prospects uh, on that fire. Maybe you throw in Josh Smith um, into that deal and Avery Weems as well, and that might be enough to get that deal done. Frankie Montas is a guy who has really not been super consistent in his career, but last year absolutely put it all together. 337 ERA in 187 innings, struck out 207. I think that might actually be more likely the Rangers go for him. It would cost less, I think. Maybe it won't even cost um, Cole Wynn to get Luis Castillo because he has had a few up and down seasons. But if you really want that pure star power that you can trust, he's got the track record of consistency. Whereas uh, Frankie Montas has been was really good this year, finished sixth in Cy Young voting this year. Has never been an All Star. Has never had uh, Cy Young votes before. So I don't know how you feel about that. Maybe that makes more sense. Maybe I'm rushing things. But this is a hypothetical scenario that I don't think is going to happen. I think they might trade for one of these guys. I think it's definitely likely, um, or one of the other two. Ray, or Reds pitchers that they've been linked to in Sonny Gray. I think Sonny Gray might actually be the most reasonable of that. But again, I really like Frankie Montas. And so in this scenario, we are going all in to the wall. We are ignoring what the Rangers have, um, reports have been coming out about the Rangers and them not being linked to this person. They have been linked one of their players who wants to trade because his both of his positions have been filled, and also the third position that he might play is also filled. Isaiah kiner Falefa has been linked to the New York Yankees. So screw it, I'm doing it. You can't stop me. There are no cops in here to stop me. I'm trading for Joey Gallo. I'm doing it, I'm making my dreams come true. I am daring to dream, and I am doing this. Joey Gallo, trade it back to the Rangers, and they sign a contract extension, and he never leaves me again, and I'm happy in baseball. It actually gives me joy again. I get to see him hitting dingers on a team where he's not the only person hitting dingers. This trade package, his trade value is honestly low. If the Rangers really want to do this, which I, again, I, they have been leaking out reports that they are not interested, but I, I want it to happen. So screw it. I'm making it happen, which, you know, that's kind of the name of this podcast. <laughs> um, but Gallo did, did very badly in, in New York. He turned it around towards the end, but again, on the whole, not a great sample size. You only got one year of him. You just traded away. Um, I'm not trading back Ezekiel Duran for him. I'm not trading back Josh Smith. I don't think they'd want Glenn Otto back. I really don't. Um, also, I already included him in the Matt Olson trade. So, um, yeah. But again, you forgot what Joey did with the Yankees. 58 games. He had a 160 batting average, a 303 on base, 
which is well below the 379 that he had with the Rangers um, and slugged only 404 versus 490 with the Rangers. That's a 707 OPS in those 58 games. Um, not his fault being in New York was just dumb and he shouldn't have been there in the first place. Trade him back, extend him, keep him here. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Now with this team right here, I think this is definitely playoff, like legit playoff contention. They still... Let's look at what this would actually look like. Here's a hypothetical lineup with these players. You got leading off Corey Seager playing shortstop, Marcus Simeon hitting in the two hole playing second base. Matt Olson is your three hole hitter at first base. Joey Gallo in right field is batting cleanup like he should be. Dolores Garcia hitting fifth playing center field. Willie Calhoun DHing hitting sixth in seventh in the seven hole. You got Cole Calhoun hitting eighth, Josh Young hitting ninth. Jose Trevino, Cole Calhoun is playing left field. Josh Young is playing third base in this scenario. And your starting rotation looks like this. Luis Castillo is your number one. Grant Gray is your number two. Dane Dunning is your number three. Taylor Hearn is the number four in this rotation. And then the fifth spot is the Spencer Howard, Colby Allard um, tandem. So in this case, they'd still probably need to go sign one more pitcher they could get. Uh, if, if they If they did all this, then I think... Clayton Kershaw might be leaning more towards coming home because that's like legit, ridiculously good um, team right there. But uh, I think Matthew Boyd is is a reasonable guy that you could go get. He didn't pitch super consistently last year, but he's, he's been very solid for the last, basically his entire career. He was always on the trading block, just like about solid. You can count on him for a bunch of innings. Um, so he would slot in about at your number three or four. So you don't have to do that little hybrid of Spencer Howard, Colby Allard in the number five spot. So you feel really good about five spots in your rotation. And in this scenario, if the Rangers are really going for it next year, then that would slot Colby, uh, Spencer Howard into the bullpen as a multi-inning dominant reliever, which might end up being his fate eventually. But I don't think the Rangers want to do that. Again, I don't think they're doing this, but if they did want to do this, that's what they do. Maybe they also sign, um, say, a Suzuki and he platoons in left field with Cole Calhoun. That gives you an even better lineup that uh, one to five, one to four is, is probably, if not the best, then one of the best one to four lineups, uh, lineups of like batting order one to four in all of baseball. If it's not the best, then it's definitely up there in like the top three, but that's a really solid team, a really solid pitching staff. You get one of those other pitchers, you get Clayton Kershaw, whoo. You get Luis Castillo, Clayton Kershaw, then John Gray is your number three. That is a dang good rotation, and uh, I would feel really, really stinking great about that. Again, I don't think this is happening. I really don't think this is happening, but I also didn't think they were going to sign Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager and John Gray all within two days. And also Cole Calhoun, I really didn't think about him at all. So I've been wrong before. I could be wrong again. And the Joey Gallo thing is basically just me wish fulfilling. But who, who cares? It's a Friday. It's been a great week. Why end it on a bummer of a note not trading for Joey Gallo? Instead, I decided to fulfill my wishes and trade for Joey Gallo. But that'll do it for this week's episodes of Locked on Rangers. Thank you guys so much for listening again and making Locked on Rangers your first listen of the day. Make sure to go follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. Follow the show at Locked on Rangers. And uh, go subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already. I would really appreciate all that good stuff. But I hope you enjoyed this episode. And thinking about scenarios where the Rangers are competing next year is very fun. They're definitely going to be better than they were last year. And they're going to be a heck of a lot of fun to watch. they still got plenty of stuff to do. Maybe they'll make these trades. Maybe the lockout will end tomorrow and everything will be glorious. And all these things will happen and I will be very happy. And, you know, the Rangers will win 18 World Series in a row. Who knows? Anything's possible, but that's going to do it for this week's edition of Locked On Rangers. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy baseball.